Saskatchewan's Military Affairs, Finance and Policy Committee will come to order. I would like to announce that this hybrid meeting will take place in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This meeting may be viewed on House Public Information TV, which is available on the House website. As is custom with this committee, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we go ahead, my members to speak into the microphone if we're talking. Uh, Mr. Petrie, please take the roll. Chair Eklund. Present. Chair Eklund, present. Representative Jean. Present. Representative Jean, present. Representative Detmer. Present. Representative Detmer, present. Representative McDonald. Present. Representative McDonald, present. Representative Berg. Present. Representative Berg, present. Representative Bliss. Present. Representative Bliss, present. Representative Edelson. Representative Greenman. Present. Representative Greenman, present. Representative Nelson. Present. Representative Nelson, present. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Poston, present. Representative Raleigh. Present. Representative Raleigh, present. Representative Sundin. Present. Representative Sundin, present. We have a quorum. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, Representative Berg, did you take a look at the minutes? I did, Chair Eklund, and I moved those minutes. Representative move, uh, Berg moves the minutes from April 5th, 2022. Any questions, additions, or deletions from the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The minutes are adopted. Members, what the process will look like today is I will move and introduce our Veterans Military Affairs Finance or Omnibus Bill. Nonpartisan staff will walk through after I move the bill. They'll walk through the appropriations and the policy aspects of the bill and we'll receive pu public testimony on, testimony on the bill. Finally, we will consider the DE1 amendment, the two amendments to the omnibus bill, and we will vote the bill out of committees. Now, members, since we are considering our omnibus bill, I will turn the gavel over to Vice Chair John. Members, uh, in front of us today, we have House File 4324 from Chair Eklund. Our committee's Omnibus Veterans and Military Affairs Finance and Policy Bill. Welcome, Chair Eklund. Please move your bill and your DE1 amendment and explain the bill and your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I move uh, House File 4324 to be moved to Ways and Means. All right, members, uh, we will now hear from nonpartisan House fiscal staff who, have, who, who will present the appropriation spreadsheet for the DE1 amendment for House File 4324. Uh, welcome, Ms. Roberts. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. I'm going to begin to share my screen, and hopefully you are able to see this. Are you able to see the spreadsheet? Yes, we can, Ms. Roberts. Yes, Ms. Roberts. Okay. Um, I'll walk through the spreadsheet now just to orient you to it. it the first columns um, in white are the fiscal year 22-23 um, numbers, and the shaded green are the tails for fiscal year 24 and 25. To begin with, on line five for military affairs, there are three change items. The first is $765,000 on line six for the Holistic Health and Fitness Program. And this is from House File 4468, Representative Greedman's bill. The next change is on line seven, the enlistment and reenlistment bonuses. That's $2 million in fiscal year 23. And then you can see that the tails increase to 2.5 million each year. And finally on line eight, um, there is $100,000 in one-time funding for the USS Minneapolis-St. Paul Commissioning. This is from House File 3315, Representative Nash's bill. And so on line, nine, on line nine, you can see the total general fund change for military affairs is $2.865 million. Moving down to veterans affairs, on line 12 is the first change item, $830,000 per year 
for an increase to the Redwood Falls State Veterans Cemetery operating funds. And this is from House File 4334, Representative Fredericksville. On line 13, there's $1.1 million in fiscal year 23 for uh, tenancy support and landlord engagement activities from House File 4337 from Representative Berg. On line 14, $8.8 million in fiscal year 23 for low barrier permanent supportive housing for veterans. Um, this is from House File 4324, the chair's bill. On line 15, you'll see $500,000 in fiscal year 22. And this is for the Fargo VA Medical Center, the um, Fisher House construction. Um, and this is from House File 4311, represent Keeler's bill. On line 16, 1.74 million in fiscal year, fiscal year 23. Um, and that is for temporary housing options and increasing engagement and outreach activities from House File 4358, Representative Eklund's bill. On line 17, um, $147,000 increase to the grants that go to veterans service organizations from House File 4335, Representative Edelson. On line 18, here you'll see one-time funding of $24.88 million, and this is for the service bonus to Minnesota's post-9-11 veterans, House File 4365, Sands Deed. Um, on line 19, $450,000 increase to the County Veteran Service Officers, or CVSO grants, House File 4333, and this is Representative Zhang's bill. Um, on line 20, $468,000 for um, the Metro Meals on Wheels, House File 3036, Representative Edelson's bill. And then finally, on line 21, $2.1 million um, in fiscal year 23 for the Minnesota Veterans Suicide Prevention Initiative. And so the total for the Department of Veterans Affairs on line 22 is $41.014 million. And the total within the DE amendment for the two um, agencies combined, you'll see on the bottom line of the spreadsheet, is 43.879 million from the general fund. And I will stop sharing my screen in case there, unless there are questions. All right. Um, Members, we will now hear from nonpartisan House research staff who will present the policy aspects for the DE1 amendment for House File 4324. Welcome, Ms. Uh, Mr. Diebel. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. I'll be covering Article 2 of the DE amendment, which is comprised of three bills that the committee recently heard. Sections one and two of article two are from Representative Zhang's House File 4333, and these modify the VSO grant program statute. Moving next to section three, this is from Representative Edelson's House File 4335, and this is the Veteran Service Organization grant program that uh, is being proposed and funded in the bill. And the final five sections of Article 2 are from Representative Sandsteed's Veteran Bonus Program, which uh, modified the eligibility and other terms for the uh, post 9-11 bonus. Pending any questions, Mr. Chair, that concludes my overview. All right, thank you, Mr. Diebel. Uh, Chair Eklund, uh, would you like to move your DE1, am DE1 amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. After the walkthrough, I'll move the DE1 amend amendment to, uh, to House File 4324. All right, Chair Eklund moves the DE1 amendment and uh, move on to the other testifiers. That's fine, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, the first testifier we have is uh, Commissioner Herkey. Excuse me. 
Mr. Chair, um, committee members, I know that uh, many of you are very familiar with the contents of this, so I think I will spend just a moment maybe talking about, especially on the veterans' homelessness, how these would work together, I think would be probably the um, most important use of our time right now. As we talked about previously, the, the housing, temporary housing program, we do have a lot of help and assistance with other organizations, but there's, there's always a need beyond what's available. And the uh, temporary housing through the hotel program, which is paid for primarily through the federal VA, will be going away this summer. We know this because they've told us and it's no longer part of their program going forward. We're also getting assisted by counties. And it's my understanding all the counties now have eliminated this uh, program, except for I think Hennepin County still has some funding left, but we don't know how long that's going to last. So the first key component in veterans homelessness is to make sure you find out where the veterans are, which the outreach will help us as we indicated in the bill. But besides understanding where they are is to place them somewhere in temporary housing. So that, that's the importance of the, the temporary housing in the hotel program that was discussed in, in, the, in this bill. The second component of that really is to find those uh, as you're working through the barriers for the individual veteran is to look and see where, where is it that the, this veteran wants to be placed, uh, what community they would like to be in, and then what landlords can we work with to make sure that they get uh, appropriate placement that meets the VA standards or our standards for our, our uh, voucher program for the state of Minnesota. One of the challenges there is that we so often with the landlords get in a situation where we're, they're finding ways of not taking the veteran, you know, based on their requirements to be a tenant in their facilities. And I think what, uh, by providing those incentives that I talked about earlier, uh, if there's damage done to the uh, facility, if they're willing to take a, a veteran that has a high barrier score, um, and also looking at a situation where we'll stand with the, the landlord, those things are very important to us being successful. In fact, that's really what in a lot of cases now it's coming down to is, can we find the right landlord that's willing to take a veteran that has uh, one or more barriers? And uh, so that's gonna be very uh, important to us as we go forward. The last part was the third item as it relates to the how veterans housing. That's really, there are some circumstances where it may be difficult, no matter how much you work with the landlord the, for them to take a veteran. And that's where those 100 uh, um, low barrier um, housing, affordable housing units will come in. And that's what will help me to get to functional zero with our veterans in the state of Minnesota. I really need that component because there is gonna be that group of people that are just gonna need that little extra something and I won't get to a potential landlord probably to take a chance on a veteran. But if I can demonstrate uh, a year or more of uh, successful rental uh, in, a, in a, one of our units, then we could maybe move that veteran out and make space for another veteran coming in. So this is very important. It's something I've never asked for before. I didn't, a year ago, honestly, I didn't know I needed this, but now I know I need this in order to be successful and get to the functional zero for the state. Again, it's my intent and the governor has uh, uh, been very supportive in this to, to make sure as quickly as possible we can get to be the fourth state to end veterans uh, homelessness in Minnesota. This is something we've been working on since 2014. I think, and I've told the committee before, I think every veteran does deserve a home. Um, those veterans have went up and beyond uh, what a normal citizen has done as far as putting their right hand up and, and willing to give up to their entire life to support the Constitution of the United States and the state of Minnesota. And uh, a lot of these veterans carry with them a huge amount of mental issues. They have physical issues. I'm just talking to veterans on the way over and some of the issues from their time you know, in are still with them years and years later. Um, so I think we owe, owe it to them to try our best to get to functional zero for the state of Minnesota. And we've done really well. And, and what I can tell you is that um, we are just received notification that the St. Louis County uh, COC will be announcing uh, functional zero. So that'll be the, the eighth 
um, continuum of care within Minnesota that will have declared, and that's been validated by the VA and by the uh, U.S. Um, Interagency Council on Homelessness. So it's, it's not something we made up, but we've actually been checked. Our numbers have been checked, and we'll be having an appropriate um, a celebration of that here coming up. And, and last year we had two other COCs, the area around the Twin Cities and also the area near the central part of Minnesota, the, uh, in the St. Cloud area and the surrounding co counties. So things are moving in the right direction. It's just a, there's a big mass of homeless veterans in the Twin Cities. And I really need the combination of these three things in order to be successful with veterans homelessness overall. And I just would, um, I'll stand for any questions on that, but I, that's one area I wanted to make sure you understood from my previous testimony how they work together and how it's important to have all of those three items included as part of the part of the bill going forward. And I, I didn't have anything else that specifically to uh, to add. I did. Uh, I, uh, I was asked about uh, home ownership. We're still looking into that as a possibility. One of the issues is if, we, if we're limited to the 100 units, uh, if we start going with home ownership, it's, it's gonna be difficult to get that uh, uh, ladder up effect, which we, a lot of times we get. The veterans will stabilize themselves in one of, our, um, one of our facilities, and then they'll go on to getting a different job and going to a different community and so forth. And we'd love to have that opportunity in order to stay at functional zero, to have those units still available going forward. And I, I see those 100 units as sort of an insurance policy that once we get to functional zero that we can maintain it going forward. So I think that's also a critical part of what we're trying to do here with, uh, with this particular area in uh, veterans homelessness. But I would stand for any questions on any of the other components uh, that we discussed earlier if there's any additional questions. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Herkey. And, uh if there are questions, we'll, we'll open it up after all the testifiers okay. have done, uh, have gone through. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Ben, jo ben Johnson, legislative director. Oh, don't need a, he had wrapped it up for you. Okay. And then uh, Mr. Don Kerr, please uh, state your name for the record and you may proceed when you're ready. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Don Kerr, and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Department of Military Affairs. And it's great to be here in person for the first time at the last hearing. Uh, but at least we got here. And I'm here on behalf of Major General Sean Mackey, the Adjutant General, who is in Norway today on the 49th reciprocal exchange with the Norwegian Home Guard. And that's a very positive thing because we haven't been able to do it for the last two years. So we're, we're back to a semblance of normalcy today in a number of ways. And I'm really here to express my thanks to the chair, to the members of the committee uh, for carrying our supplemental budget items that, that we briefed to you and, and that are being supported in the bill. We really appreciate that. I also <coughs> wanted to express my appreciation to the members of the committee for your interest, your thoughtful questions, and the interaction that we've had, and, and for your support of our policy initiatives, which are both awaiting final passage in one chamber or the other right now, that we're both carried by members of this committee, and I appreciate that and as does General Mackey. And I don't really have a lot else to say about it other than thank you for your support. And I wanna wish you all the best as you, uh, you get to get a week off here and then come back and stand on your heads for the last five weeks of this process, <laughs> uh, which is very important. And it's gonna to be tough on you. I understand how that works, but understand that, that the actions that you're taking are, are really very important. And uh, you know, the members of the National Guard have undergone not only a really incredible operational tempo for the last 20 years on the federal side, but that's been exacerbated in the last three years on the domestic operations support missions that we've added to that. And I, I can't tell you enough how much the support of our legislature has meant to us in being able to support our service members on the street with our enlistment incentives appropriation, with the state tuition reimbursement program and other programs that Minnesota has that other states just don't do. And we really are the envy of the nation and that's because of the generosity of the legislature. Hopefully it's well-deserved. We think it is uh, because we think we're providing a great service back to you. And the uh, changes that you're making this year will allow us to continue to retain our service members and maintain the quality that you've all come to expect of your Minnesota National Guard. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Kerr. Uh, Mr. Kerr. 
Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Greg Peterson from the Veterans Service Officer and Executive Team. Hi, my in. name is Greg Peterson. Welcome. Um, thank you very much. I'm the Legislative Director for the Minnesota Association of County Veterans Service Officers, a membership run organization of 150 County Veterans Service Officers employed in our 87 counties. I've been a County Veterans Service Officer for 18 years and am eighth highest in senior seniority. I'd like to talk about uh, the CVSO grant program, Line 19, House File. 4333. First, though, I'd like to thank the Minnesota Legislature for creating the Minnesota County Veteran Service Officer Program 77 years ago. We've evolved immensely since 1945 and have helped hundreds of thousands of veterans, dependents, and survivors. Today's CVSOs attend specialized training. In fact, I've been all day uh, in training and just got off a half hour ago. Uh, we receive a FBI background investigation with fingerprints, take an annual exam. We adhere to ethical standards, possess unique skills, and practice talents beyond that of personal and moral obligations. We require a high degree of competency to help our customers navigate federal and state programs. And we extend unrivaled empathy to each and everyone that seeks our assistance. The CVSO grant program has been in existence since 1993 and uses the number of veterans in each county to determine the funding distribution. The veteran population is reported annually by the National Center for Veterans Analysis and Statistics, and they base their findings on estimates and projections. Basically, they guess. Uh, an unintended fallacy of the distribution model is that veteran population is not synonymous with our client caseload. The data is devoid of spouses, dependent children, widows, and the nearly 13,000 citizen soldiers in Minnesota. County veteran service officers count on grants to fund outreach, assist in the reintegration of combat veterans, collaborate with other agencies, and heed the governor's 2014 mandate to eliminate veteran homelessness. We work very closely with Commissioner Herkey and his team to get every homeless veteran off the street. Since the last appropriation in 2013, one third of our counties have dropped off of their population tier and lost critical funding. Three counties fell off in the last fiscal year, each lot losing $2,500. By slightly increasing the appropriation and allowing the commissioner to provide competitive grants, our service officers will be able to recoup lost funding and implement new and innovative programs that work in their unique situations. Our association also favors the increase in the appropriation to our association which we use for administrative costs, training, certifying our service officers and reintegration services. We are the only state that sends a team of CVSOs to army bases where our deployed guardsmen are offboarded from military to civilian status. We meet with every soldier. We interview them for health concerns and complete VA forms, and we provide them their CVSO contact information before they return home and hang up their uniforms. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about uh, the Veteran Service Organization Grant Program. Uh, that was Subdivision 2C. CVSOs uh, value and depend on our congressionally chartered VSOs uh, to aid Minnesota veterans. Uh, there are eight congressionally chartered veterans organizations, uh, and they all have numerous programs unique to themselves and unique to who they serve. Uh, and we CVSOs work jointly uh, with them, getting information out to our county, vet, out to our customers, I mean, and, uh, and it, it just helps all of us out to be able to use all of the different programs they have. I have a list of programs prepared to talk about, but I, I've said it once before, and uh, it's just, very helpful uh, to continue to fund our county, excuse me, our 
congressionally chartered veteran service organizations. Uh, with that, I'm uh, open to any questions you might have. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Peterson, for your testimony. Next, we have uh, Mr. Rob Dorr, who will be joining us via right. Zoom. Thank Welcome. you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Please state your name, and you can proceed with your testimony. All right, my name is Rob Doran. I am the Senior Vice President of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. I uh, just wanted to quickly um, discuss the A3 amendment. There's a portion in there which modifies a, uh, a, a piece that was in the uh, underlying delete all amendment that uh, we believed was a little bit unclear, gave us a little bit of pause, uh, but we also saw an opportunity. Uh, the language in the A3 amendment has to deal with uh, providing uh, information to firearms dealers and uh, gun shops, gun ranges, places like that, uh, and anywhere that may sell guns. Uh, information to customers, uh, in, in this particular instance uh, aimed at veterans, uh, who are purchasing firearms about safe storage laws in Minnesota, as well as uh, mental health and suicide resources. Uh, we think this is really good information to get uh, out there. Uh, as, as this committee is well aware, over 20 veterans a, a, a day died of suicide uh, disproportionately by firearms. And um, it's uh, any little thing that we can do to help somebody realize that there that there is uh, help out there. There is um, there is our services available uh, is good. And and uh, you know I, I think we've kicked around. Uh, uh, Nami Minnesota is supportive of this language. Uh, the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus and Nami worked on. Uh, the A3 amendment language, uh, at least the, the portion uh, pertaining to the um, uh, the suicide prevention programs, and uh, uh, you know, we've kicked around some ideas about ways that that might uh, met, that might go about. But actually, having the uh, the um, agency work with stakeholders to develop this uh, and then implement it, uh, we think is going to be a tremendous service and will help save lives. So we would uh, encourage all of your support uh, for that portion. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Doerr. And uh, so we'll move on. Any questions or comments from members for our testifiers? And it looks like we have Representative Raleigh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first question I've got is to uh, Mr. Herkey, if we could, please. Commissioner Herkey. All right, Commissioner Herkey. Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Herkey, uh, uh, can you uh, tell us about the um, the veterans' homes that are being uh, discussed as far as the funding that would go with this? Are you are you foreseeing any supply chain issues, or are these facilities already purchased? I'm uh, meaning, are they already in place, or is this going to be a purchase uh, as part of this appropriation? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Ch uh, Representative Raleigh. Uh, Rep Mr. Chair, Representative oh, Raleigh. Commissioner Herkey. Um, just a clarification, which, are you talking about the new homes construction or are you talking about? Through the Chair, Raleigh. yes, through the, the new home construction. All right, Commissioner Herkey. Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Representative Raleigh, the new new homes, uh, I don't believe we've got anything in this okay. bill. That would be in the bonding bill for the new homes for the $10.3 mm -hmm. that we're currently short. The shortfall in, for those homes is uh, fixtures, uh, some equipment, fixtures. and furniture. And then uh, there's a little bit of owner's um, contingency funding in there because of the fact that I do have enough funding theoretically right now to finish these facilities. They're at about 22% completion right now across the board. But I do not have enough to buy the beds, the furniture, and and uh, all the other equipment that will uh, outfit to include like kitchens and so forth, they'll outfit those facilities. But that, that's in the, actually in the bonding bill. All right, Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Commissioner, um, are any of these facilities in a location that would be at risk for any of the rent control? And, and would these facilities fall under the jurisdictions of like the St. Paul rent control that's gonna be implemented soon? Or does this fall outside of it? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Raleigh, are, are we talking now about uh, the landlords and, and uh, 
re renting through landlords throughout for the we're, homelessness? Is that what we're talking about at this point? <laughs> and Mr. Chair, that's around. exactly what I'm what I'm asking. Does okay. what I'm hoping to hear, try, not trying to lead you, uh, Mr. Herkey, but what I'm hoping to hear is that this is a completely separate issue. And it's I've heard from a few constituents: Is this going to be something that is going to affect? Our veterans, is it in any way an issue that we're going to have to deal with at some point? Commissioner Hurt. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Or Representative Raleigh, I don't believe the rent control is going to have a big uh, impact on us. It actually might can potentially help us, but uh, I don't think it's going to have a large impact. Most of the issues we have with our veterans is getting landlords that will take, okay. take those veterans that have those barriers that would, they normally wouldn't be a tenant for them but because we're able to help them through some of these landlord supports, that they're willing to take a chance on one of our veterans that have one or more barriers to being a tenant. Representative Rothman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that you, you've gone to exactly the heart of the issue is, I wanna make sure that we're anticipating whether any of these uh, rent controls or the, some of the, the um, um, some of the things that are coming down the line in some of these uh, cities, is not gonna further inhibit veterans from being able to move into these facilities. So what I'm hearing right now is awesome. I'm, that, that's really encouraging. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My next question was for um, Rob Dorr, if I could please. Representative Rob. Uh, with uh, Mr. Dorr joining us via Zoom. Representative Raleigh, to your question. Got it, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and Mr. Doerr, um, as we're taking a look at the language that's being inserted, to develop in consultation with stakeholders, written information on safe storage, um, how have you seen written information best used when dealing with the purchase of a firearm uh, when you're in front of an FFL or you're um, at a facility where you're, you're purchasing it? Do you have any recommendations on what's been used best in the past? Because written is, uh, I think what we're looking for is what best practices have you seen in the past with the written information, Mr. Chair? Mr. Doerr. Uh, Mr. Chair and Re Representative Rowley, I think uh, you know, s some of the uh, more obvious things is, is state statute requires all of these stores to hang a large sign that says it's unlawful to you know, uh, to store a firearm where minors can access it. That's the language in 609.666. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's an obvious one. Uh, and then there's also various ATF uh, requirements that FFLs are required to display that don't lie for the other guy poster uh, and things like that. I, I think those are, are or something that may be beneficial. I think what we're envisioning and what I'm hoping, uh, and I, I certainly hope we have the opportunity to provide input uh, in consultation is this, is maybe something like a, a sticker or a magnet or a brochure that gets handed out with firearm uh, sales, or at least is available to uh, to uh, purchasers uh, yeah, at these uh, federally licensed dealers so that uh, it, it has some sort of a visual catch that an individual, particularly a veteran, if they see a sticker, they see a brochure, it, it just is that reminder that there is help available. And I think that that that, that slight, slight moment of pause and intercession is uh, is what we're looking for, at least uh, speaking for ourselves, but we look forward with, uh, to working with the agency to offer our input. And I know NAMI is looking forward to, to that opportunity as well. Representative Rowland. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, Mr. Dorr, I appreciate the effort you're putting into this one and also making sure that you're working with NAMI because you know, we not only want to make sure that we get the information to the veterans, but we, we have to contemplate how to um, get the information without it getting buried in everything else. Because the, when you purchase a firearm nowadays, you get brochures for this and all kinds of uh, pamphlets and everything else. Um, I, I think the last thing that I'd uh, mention on this is we're taking a look at um, the safe storage of weapons. There is Operation um, Child Safe. There is um, anybody, veterans or civilians, you can go to your police departments and you can request a free lock. There's a lot of opportunities to make sure that you know, weapon storage is done safely. Highly, highly support this and anything we can do to make sure that the correct message gets to the veterans. And again, what Mr. Dorr said was very important, and that is if we can provide that moment of a pause um, and one thing that I heard, Mr. Chair, that uh, was, was an interesting thing is uh, veterans will take uh, the key to their lock and they'll put it in a, um, an ice tray and they'll freeze the key and leave it in the freezer. 
If you need to retrieve the gun, go and get the ice cube, put it underneath water, it'll thaw out in under a minute. But it gives you that moment of pause to go from the anger or the situation to being able to think about it, and I'm hoping that that's what this will do as well, is to be able to provide a moment of pause to reevaluate where your emotions are at and then redirect and uh, stay safe. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Rowley. And uh, Representative, Representative Detmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have a question for uh, Mr. Kerr. All right. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it does. You might as well stay up. <laughs> Representative Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kerr, how's reenlistments going since the COVID last Mr. two Kerr. years? Mr. Chair, for the record again, I'm Don Kerr, the Executive Director of the Department of Military Affairs. Uh, and uh, Representative Detmer, our team is doing a great job, but they're below expectation. And that is a, is a problem nationwide right now. In fact, uh, the press bud that recently came out, actually the Army is taking a position to allow 10,000 fewer troops in the Army. And that's mostly based on their acknowledgement that they're having great difficulty recruiting in the current environment for a number of reasons. A lot of those have to do with uh, the current population being ineligible for enlistment due to a number of factors, including uh, the use of prescription medications to treat uh, for Ritalin and that type of thing, along with interaction with law enforcement and uh, weight. All right. And Ryan Mr. Ripson Chair and, and Mr. Kerr, um, can you predict how many less reserve component or National Guard component that we're going to be looking at the next year or so? Mr. Kerr? And Mr. Chair, Representative Detmer, I think you mean in, in Minnesota specifically yes. or the global numbers? Yeah, yeah Mr. Mr. Chair, excuse me. Yes, Minnesota. Oh, okay. I can tell you that nationally the National Guard is going to be at the same end strength that they had, uh, that had been at the previous year. Uh, they're going to stay up there. Uh, we expect that we're going to continue to hover right around 10,300 to 10,500. Uh, which is about where we are now. We had been up above 11,000 for a while, and we have uh, actually been directed downward a little bit from the national level, because they do have an end strength cap on the entire nation. All that stuff has to fit inside the budget at the national level as well. We generally outperform our weight in that uh, area, but we are seeing that our numbers are not as strong as they once were. Again, our recruiting force is performing in the top tier. They're, they're second or third in the nation, uh, behind states like Texas that have twice as many recruiters and four or five mm -hmm. times the population. But it is a challenge for us out there. Um, and that's one reason that we're really kind of doubling down on retention right now uh, by looking at these programs that we feel can really help us retain soldiers in the Minnesota National Guard. That buys us a little bit of time. Now, the, the challenge is that, that all that is is a short-term solution, though. At some point, we have to figure out how to recruit because the big green machine operates in a certain fashion. We have a large number of junior soldiers that have to be replenished in the bottom, and some of those have to attrit out before they're promoted or else the system doesn't work right. And if we retain too many soldiers, it means slower promotions and a distant center for people that do want to stay. Uh, so it's a, it's a very carefully balanced equation, but we think we can buy some short-term relief by, adding, uh, by increasing our, our efforts at retaining our so soldiers uh, while we kind of figure out what we're going to do from a recruiting perspective at the national level. Yeah. Representative Devin. Mr. Chair and Mr. Kerr, um, <clears throat> have you been able to enter the, the schools around the state like you did, like we did before, to uh, talk about the opportunities that we have in, in the uh, in the military, Mr. Kirk. Mr. Chair, Representative Detmer, we have had pretty good success starting to get back into the schools. There are still are some restrictions out there, and we do still have some lingering challenges in certain school districts that have always uh, hindered our access, uh, and that that kind of continues to be the case. Uh, and that is a, a, a ball wall we would like to see taken down if we can, uh, but we're continuing to work that in our local communities and. Uh, recruiters are very resourceful people. They, they try to find ways to gain access to populations, but that is an area that we're struggling with yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Thank right. you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and Mr. Kerr, in terms of the, we have 765,000 in the holistic health mm -hmm. program. Could you just maybe share with the, the committee here what that's all about? It's something new, and uh, where are we going with that? Mr. Kerr. Mr. Chair, Representative Detmer, and I, I did actually present this to the committee, and but I'll, I'll reiterate it, happy to. Uh, holistic Health and Fitness is the philosophy that the Army is using to guide their physical training program, where we, what the old timers among us who were in the Army remember as being PT, 
uh, holistic health and fitness goes beyond just the physical aspects and adds psychological, mental, physical, and also uh, sleep management into the, into the equation. Uh, the specific dollars we're asking for, Mr. Chair and Representative Detmer, are 765 for five full-time equivalents to add uh, some individuals that we think can, first of all, a couple of uh, professional practitioners, a dietitian, and a physical therapist, and then a program manager, a program analyst, and one other position related to that to help provide counsel and guidance to our unit commanders to help them implement the Army's um, H2F concept across the force. Mm -hmm. yeah, Representative Mr. Chair, your five FTEs, it kind of sounds like they're not going to be military with military background. Is, am I correct? Or maybe they are. Mr. Chair, Representative Detmer, no. Actually, three of them will be military. Two of them will be civilian practitioners. Okay. All right. Uh, Representative Detmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's my questions for Mr. Kerr. All right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Post. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions for the bill author. Um, represent, or uh, I'm sorry, Chair Eklund. Um, you know, I'm reading here that we're going to develop a plan for safe storage for veterans-owned firearms when a veteran is in crisis. And I think that's great that we're doing that. Who is going to be involved in that plan? Are they already working on this, or is there, is there a group that you're putting together to do this? Uh, Chair Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Paulson, that might be a better question for uh, Commissioner Herkey. Okay, very good. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Herkey. Ms. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, the intent there is to sort of follow the Wisconsin model as it relates to working with uh, gun, gun shops. And in Wisconsin, they're trying to get two gun, minimum of two gun shops per county and to have a voluntary program if the if it's a situation, you know, where the 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 actual uh, veteran believes that they they need for whatever to have space between them and their firearms, that was the intent. I think that sort of augments some of the things you've talked here about uh, providing information and so forth. And and this is really just to try to focus and give opportunities. Um, just on a personal level, my my wife was a veteran, and she had some issues. Um, She's allowed me to share this with you, but uh, she had some issues as it related to ment her mental health, and she'd asked me to take the firearms and, and do something. I had a, a father-in-law that was, I was able to store those firearms out of the house, which made her feel better. Um, we're just trying to provide some opportunities to the veterans in Minnesota, and I think it's a worthy program and something we'd like to get into along with the work as it relates to the outreach and, and the, you know, providing written materials and so forth. And uh, Chair Eklund. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Poston, um, in my district alone in the last quarter, there's been six veteran suicides, all of them by firearm. And so that's when, when I saw this piece of legislation that it struck home to me because it's, a, it's, it's something that's affecting our veteran uh, population in a, in a big, big way. Representative Poston. Well, I think it's really important <clears throat> that we're doing this. I'm glad to hear that the, the planning has begun. Um, my second question, if I may, Mr. No, Chair, my second question, um, Chair Eklund, is we had a, a really big reduction in the bonuses uh, from $40 million to uh, $25 million. Can you talk about that a little bit, why such a, a big reduction? Chair Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, Ms. Roberts gave us some data from the last uh, uh, bonus program that happened in the Persian Gulf bonus and about 60% of the eligible people actually applied for the bonus and so what we did is we figured out where the number of 60% was and I believe if you look at where we're at right now we're at 62.38 or something like that percent from the 40 million that we started out with and to accomplish some of the other things that I want to do in this that we want to do as a as a veterans committee in this bill as far as veterans homelessness and other things, we had to find the, the resources to do it. So that's why we backed it down. Um, I think the legislature in the past for other veterans bonuses ha has come through. So if we find out that we need more, then it'll be up to whoever's chairing the next committee to carry that, that uh, uh, next year's committee to carry that forward. Representative Post. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Eklund. So we're, we're taking that $15 million and we're using it for other veteran initiatives. 
Representative, uh, Representative Paulson, yes, we are. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, any other member questions or comments for the testifiers? Um, I understand that we have an uh, A1 amendment to the DE1 from Representative Detmer. Yes. Uh, Representative Detmer, please move and explain your amendment. Yes, Mr. Chair, I move the A1 amendment. Mark. And, Mr. and Mr. Chair and, and uh, members, you also have a handout. If you would take a look at that. Um, what, what this amendment does, it brings some of the money from the uh, MACV, which uh, has been allotted $8.8 million, and, and brought 800000 of that to the uh, Disabled Vets Camp on Big Marine Lake. And some background on that, if you take a look, uh, there's also one word that needs to be changed, Mr. Chair. It says four wastewater systems, but actually, if you take a look at the map on the next page, that I just got this from the, um, from the agency that's uh, putting together information for the Disabled Vets Camp, there's actually eight systems that we need to update. And if we don't update these systems, um, we're on a nice clean lake there, Big Marine Lake, and if these systems are not updated, we, can, uh, we could have a problem there, and the Minnesota PCA says they need to be updated. So that's what that money is. I did contact Mac V. Neil Leibolt, and uh, he, had, he had shared with me that he had not requested the $8.8 .8 $8 million. Uh, this is from the governor, and uh, uh, he had no problem with 800,000 going to the disabled vets camp. Now that's not, you know, that's up to our committee, up to the chair to, uh, to uh, make that transfer of funds. And uh, so, Mr. Chair, can I uh, change that word four to eight? Can that be a verbal amendment? Yes. Okay. That'd yes, Representative okay. Representative Dubmer. Okay. And a little background on the vet veterans camp. Last year, during the 12 months, uh, we had 41,000 veterans and their families that visited the camp, many of them uh, camping out with their, with their trailers, RVs. We have winterized cabins there too. They're handicap accessible. And in the past, we did get some funding for them through legacy funds because the, the camp is a historic camp. It dates back to World War I. And it was an overflow for the VA hospital. They have year-round activities for the veterans and their families. Now we're seeing a lot of young veterans and their families come into the camp. So <clears throat> we've improved the playgrounds. We've added playgrounds for the young, for the young families. So uh, I would ask your support for, uh, for the A1 amendment. I think this is something that is important for the veterans and their families. And they, they open up for the, uh, for the camping and for the RVs, they open up uh, it, April 15th, and they shut that part of the camp down October 15th. But they have winterized cabins that are open year round. They have cross country skiing uh, in the winter. They, have, uh, they bring a lot of uh, disabled veterans out there for, uh, for different activities. They have uh, ice fishing. They have all sorts of activities year round. So I'd appreciate your support and that we can uh, help uh, fund that uh, Wastewater septic system update. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Representative Detmer. Any questions or comments from members? Just, just to clarify, Mr. Yep. Chair, um, we should say uh, when we do vote on this, the A1 amendment as amended. As amended. Yeah, yeah. so I just want to make sure we hit that process point. All right. Uh, Representative Detmer, any final comments on your A1 amendment? Mr. Chair, not really. Oh, oh, I think, chair. Uh, Sorry, Chair. Uh, chair, I, I think the chair has some yeah. comments too. I prior, prior, prior to Representative Detmer's final comments, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm going to accept this amendment, but I, I want to put some qualifications on it. Um, this isn't a normal way to get sewer projects funded through the Veterans Committee. The the other ways to do it is go through PFA, through the bonding. Whatever the process is, Representative Detmer, I know it's a 501c3, okay. but when 501c3s want a bonding project, they can find a non, 
another uh, another eight entity to be the fiscal agent uh, to uh, apply for that. Um, luckily, uh, through good financial management, the state's in a good position to be able to accept these kind of uh, projects right now. Uh, we are sitting on a little bit of surplus, I heard. So I'm going to accept this amendment, uh, I, but I also want to make sure that uh, going forward that this isn't an end to this because no matter who's chairing this committee next year, we're going to have the same type of thing come forward and I would hate to see the Veterans Committee become the place for pet projects to go. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, Representative Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your comments, uh, Chair Eklund. Uh, again, um, if you haven't visited the camp, you need to get out there and see the camp. And uh, they have a little uh, a pub or a little tavern out there, too, that uh, veterans can come and enjoy themselves. They have playground activities for kids, and we have a, tire, or a flag retirement ceremony. Last year, we retired over 50,000 flags. Uh, if you don't know how you retire an American flag, is that you burn them, and they lay them out on a metal structure, and uh, they burn them that way. And, uh, they act, and actually, there's a ceremony for retiring flags, too. It's uh, pretty emotional for a lot of these uh, veterans. And a lot of the veterans that utilize the camp now, many of them are your Vietnam War veterans, and then your your uh, younger veterans now that are coming off hack to duty or in the guard of the reserve. So thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, thank you, Representative Detmer. All those in favor of uh, adopting the uh, A1? Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Jeff Diebel from House Research. Um, Mr. Diebel. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. The, uh, it's, the process does not allow you to amend an amendment to an amendment. So. It would be appropriate to adopt the amendment as drafted and then when the bill is heard next to make that technical change in the author's amendment. I don't think it's necessary to be resolved today, but it would be inappropriate to amend the amendment to the amendment. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you, Mr. Debo, for that knowledge. Uh, we, we will redo this, okay, members? <laughs> thank you. All those in favor of adopting the A1 amendment to House File 4324. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries and the amendment is adopted. Um, members, we also have an A3 author's amendment to the DE1. Uh, Chair Eklund, please move and explain your uh, amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll move the A3 author's amendment to the DE1. Uh, this author's amendment is just basically a cleanup. Uh, Lines 1.3 to 1.11, uh, you heard the language that Mr. Dorr talked about for, uh, that was developed with NAMI, that was, that was added after they saw this bill, which, uh, with this uh, omnibus bill, which I, I'm thankful that uh, NAMI weighed in on this. I think it's good lang language we uh, uh, adopted there. And then if you go uh, on, line, on page four, line 4.8, uh, 4.8 and 4.10. Last year we, we passed the Veterans Resiliency Resilience Project. There was a couple of uh, technical changes that had to be added there. Uh, it was, one was Veterans, it should say Veteran Resilience Project. And then in the next line it, it says Veteran again. It just, we had one, one too many S's on the, on the language. <laughs> so uh, uh, as Mr. Diebel just uh, showed us, we have great staff to catch these things. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Uh, Diebel, Mr. Diebel is a JAG officer in the Army Reserve, so he knows what he's doing. <laughs> uh, Chair Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then on the last page, page five of the A3 amendment is uh, the language that we've been asking for in every committee hearing is uh, annual reporting. It's the annual reporting language that's been added to yeah, this yeah. omnibus bill. So that, Mr. Chair, I'll stand for any questions. All right, uh, members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, none on Zoom. Uh, Chair, Chair Eklund, any final comments on your A3 author's amendment? Oh, I just uh, ask the committee to accept. It's just technical changes. All right, all those in favor of adopting the A3 author's amendment to House File 4324 as, as amended, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The motion carries and the amendment is adopted. 
All right, members, we are back to the discussion of the DE1 as amended. Uh, further discussion from members? Uh, seeing none, none from Zoom. Uh, Chair Eklund, any final comments or your DE1 author's amendment as amended? Thank you, Mr. Chair. What a difference a day makes. Right. Um, House file 4324 is a result of the work that we have done this year in this committee. <clears throat> when I was appointed as chair of the Veterans Military Finance and Policy Committee four years ago, I made it clear from the first day of committee that my priorities as chair was going to be tackling veteran suicide and veterans homelessness. House file 4324 is definitely moving in that direction. I'm also proud that we are providing a re-enlistment grant program for our National Guard. The Guard has done a tremendous job helping the state of Minnesota come through this pandemic and get past this pandemic, if and when we ever do get past this pandemic, and I want to thank them for that. The re-enlistment bonus, Mr. Chair, members, is the least we can do to thank them. And as Mr. Uh, Representative Detmer questioned Mr. Kerr, we may have trouble recruiting down in the, in the future, so these re-enlistment bonuses are critical to uh, uh, the Guard program. I'm also proud of the post 9-11 bonus program for our veterans that served during this time period. Uh, we put our troops through a lot of stress, and as some we've heard in some of these past committee hearings, we don't fight our battles like we used to. Our, our, our troops for, uh, face multiple deployments over and over and over again until they're worn out. And we need to do the best we can to take care of them when they come back. So Mr. Chair and members, this is good legislation. I think we, I, we did a lot of work, a lot of good work here in committee and I ask for a yes vote. All right, all those in favor of adopting the DE1 author's amendment to House File 4324 as amended, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The motion carries and the amendment is adopted. Um, seeing no more amendments, we are back to House File 4324 as amended. Um, any further questions or comments from the members? Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, Representative. Um, uh, Representative McDonald had to step out for a moment okay. for a personal issue. Certainly. Um, I'm not sure procedurally how we ask to wait for a moment to see if we can retrieve him. Okay. Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, Representative uh, Rowling, thank you. I think he had a hearing in commerce, and so uh, we certainly, uh, Chair Eklund. Mr. Chair, we are quite a bit ahead of schedule. If, if, if we can find, uh, oh, there, he there he is. Okay. All right. <laughs> We're holding up a vote for you, Representative McDonald. <laughs> 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 All right, we'll let you get seated, Representative McDonald, and uh, it seems uh, you were on the list uh, with a question, and uh, when you're ready, you may ask. Oh, very good. Well, the question probably was asked, perhaps, and if it was, certainly stop me. That's fine. I had a question regarding the uh, suicide uh, prevention for the veterans, and um, of course, this hits home on many families, right? We all have, uh, I, I would predict, been affected. Unfortunately, in the city of Delano, we had three veterans within two, three years, young kids that I had photographed in new families that committed suicide, some by gun, car accidents. So it is a very sensitive issue for everyone, not included, but uh, I certainly was close to uh, an incident within three years, three boys in a town of 5,564. So I'm just curious, this new language in the bill, uh, um, what, um, can you expand a little bit more on how those monies will prevent and or get to those who have uh, uh, suicidal and tendencies. I'll caveat that with uh, Representative Raleigh did mention the ice cube with the key. Um, that was good information, but any furthermore with your bill, with that funding, uh, with the new language. Uh, Rep Chair Eklund. Sorry, Mr. Chair, Representative McDonald, I will probably have Commissioner Herkey come back up and answer that because the agency is the one that brought this to me. But while you were away and on your uh, uh, other committee, um, I, I did share with the committee that we had um, three veterans in the last six months in my district. I can't remember what I said. I think last quarter, I think I said, that committed suicide all by firearm. Yeah. And, and that the question came about from Representative Poston on this, on this storage issue that we're, that we're working on in the bill. And so it hits, it hits home close to me when you have three people in your district have that happen. It's, it's uh, terrible for the person, obviously, and terrible uh, worse for the families. So uh, I'll, I'll turn the question over to Commissioner Herkey. All right, Commissioner Herkey. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative McDonald, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Uh, 
As you know, this was not included as part of the governor's uh, request. It's not, uh, not for the fact that it's not important. Uh, the challenge was that we're, as we're developing our program, getting our two FTEs online that have been really been helping with the Minnesota Department of Health. We're actually helping them to move their process along a little bit faster. We know it's important because we know that we're losing between 100 and 125 veterans each year in Minnesota. So we, we understand the importance of this work. Um, we felt uh, when Chair Eckland asked me if there's anything more we could do right now, we had a couple thoughts. One was the firearm uh, safety and storage. I think that's important. We were just discussing that a little bit while you were, I think you were, you, you were gone. So we see that uh, informing and providing opportunities is an important part of this. The other part is uh, public health uh, direction. What we've seen is a lot of positive uh, outcomes from a social worker that's focused on veterans at some of the larger health systems. The one that's been working well so far is Regions Hospital. They have a, they call her a hero, a hero's helper or something like that is her name, and she's a social worker. But she works the uh, for outreach with the veterans. As soon as they know that it is a veteran and there's an issue, she's right there to help and assist and bring all the different um, benefits, both from a federal side and a state side. And it's something I'd never thought of before, but it's working quite well at Regions Hospital. We would like to do a pilot to try it in a few more locations and see if we can have some positive outcomes. We believe it has had an impact on several Vet veterans that have had challenges and it's actually helped them bring them not only the the help and assistance they need um, at that immediate moment but seeing if there's other things that they need in the area of uh, suicide prevention so we we see that as an, an important and this particular uh, the 400,000 indicated in this pilot would be five FTEs that would be covered and again this is a public health effort so we try five different locations and this person would be would be a state employee we think it's important to do that like we do for our other outreach positions similar to what you heard heard from greg peterson we want to make sure they're qualified and they have all the skill sets similar to a cvso but working in a hospital setting as a social worker so we think that that's a, a great work there and i think i covered the two uh, two elements that are uh indicated as part of this. So we, we really are in a, starting on an execution phase in our suicide prevention program, and this will be very helpful as we go forward to, to, uh, to work in these, at least these two areas to begin with, to see what we can do to decrease these numbers. Again, our, our goal is a 20% reduction by 2025, and that's not that far down the road. But we do believe this, uh, coupled with some of the other things that we're doing as part of our programming will get us to that point and we will see a significant reduction in the next few years. And uh, that, that's the reason that uh, I think the chair had asked what we could do. We feel this is what we can do right now as an agency and we look to be there with the Department of Health and helping them as they come up with their plan uh, for suicide reduction here in the upcoming years. All right, uh, Chair Eklund, did you have any and just, just one comment on that, and it, it, it just uh, occurred to me. Uh, if you remember when Representative Edelson brought her Meals on Wheels bill, um, the commissioner made the comment there that then this is how this whole, all, this whole bill is working together, that the Meals on Wheels folks are going to have one more contact with the veterans and a uh, point of reference if they recognize that there's uh, potentially not good things happening in the house. So I, that's, I, I think if you take a look at how we put this bill together, it's, gonna, it's all going to work towards one goal. All right, uh, Representative McDonald. Oh, you, oh we had, uh, sorry, we, we had someone on uh, Zoom, Mr. Doerr, to uh, respond yes, if, to the question too. Yes, sorry. if I could just chime in on, uh, on Representative McDonald's uh, point, Mr. Chair. Yep, yep Mr. Doerr. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative McDonald, I think uh, at least as far as the, the uh, A3 amendment with the $150,000 appropriation, I know that the, uh, the, the department is interested in uh, following a model that's out of Wisconsin where some gun shops will uh, temporarily hold uh, a firearm. 
uh, for uh, for a veteran who's in crisis. Uh, I think part of uh, our organization's concern is th how how that may be perceived by by uh, veterans. So I, I appreciate the the department and uh, the uh, the author uh, representative Eklund willing to work with stakeholders on that because something that both NAMI and the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus has seen among uh, all of our members, but particularly among veterans uh, who have a plethora of resources available to them, but very frequently they hesitate using those those resources that are provided by the government because they're concerned that utilizing those resources will have an adverse impact on their Second Amendment rights. Uh, so I think working with stakeholders is going to be beneficial in making sure that uh, that, that message is communicated in a way that's uh, welcoming to uh, veterans who, who uh, may need assistance, but may be adversely uh, concerned about how that, uh, that seeking that assistance would affect their rights. All right, thank you, Mr. Dorr. Uh, Representative McDonald. Thank you. Yeah, that's very similar to medical marijuana. Uh, several veterans uh, and others that uh, are concerned about their Second Amendment rights don't use medical marijuana, although it could heal them. We have our own, one of our own members uh, that are uh, very hesitant to do so. Lastly, question, Commissioner Herkey. Uh, how often or common is um, copycat suicide? And the reason I ask that is uh, in my hometown in Delano, uh, a Marine took his life, and they had a huge event at the American Legion. Uh, his whole brigade flew in from all over, and, uh, or some of them. And it was such a beautiful event with the family and the community uh, and his buddies. And um, his friend from Delano then, after that, did the same thing, took his life. Commissioner Herkey. So it's so thank it's, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair, Representative McDonald. I know that's uh, something that does happen. Um, I can't get, quote you the percentages, you know, of, of, of copycat situations. I know that there is there is a lot of um, focus on that. I, I, but what I would say more than that, more than the copycat situation, there's just a lot of people out there that are hurting and mental health. I just read the report that came out from uh, from the from the federal VA and the federal VA is saying that uh, mental health conditions for our veterans are actually going to increase and increase anywhere from 15 to 20% over the next 10 years. So there's, there's a significant need for help and assistance as it relates to that. And uh, I think these are some first steps that really can go a long ways towards helping, helping out these veterans, you know, no matter what their situation is. I think the big thing is you got to get the veterans where they're at, whether it's in the hospital, at the, at the county fair or wherever, and be there to be able to help and support them when they need the help and support. And many times it's working with those communities and the people in the communities to make them aware of the signs so that we can help these veterans before they even know that they need help. And that's where I'm hoping we're going to get uh, in our communities with our veterans going forward and there, there are definitely some, I've seen this, the deep dive that's been done. There are some hot spots within the state of Minnesota that need immediate attention. And that's where we're gonna spend a majority of our time to begin with and use the resources that you're hopefully going to provide us here through this legislation. So I just wanna thank you for, for stepping into this and having the support of, of Chair Eklund and the committee to be able to help and assist our veterans in this area. Representative McDonald. That is my, finish my question, Mr. Chair. All right, um, any other questions or comments? Chair Eklund, any final comments for the committee? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I appreciate uh, the work we've done on this bill. I think we've done a good job putting a good bill together, and I ask for a yes vote. All right, Chair Eklund renews his motion that House File 4324, as amended, be referred to the Ways, uh, Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Mr. Petri, please take the roll. Chair Eklund. Yes. Chair Eklund, yes. Representative Zhang. Yes. Representative Zhang, yes. Representative Detmer. Yes. Representative Detmer, yes. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative McDonald, yes. Representative Berg. Yes. Representative Berg, yes. Representative Bliss. Yes. Representative Bliss, yes. Representative Edelson. Yes. Representative Edelson, yes. Representative Frederick. Yes. Representative Frederick, yes. Representative Greenman. Yes. Representative Greenman, yes. Representative Nelson. Nelson, yes. Representative Nelson, yes. Representative Poston. Yes. Representative Poston, yes. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, yes. Representative Raleigh, yes. Representative Sundin. Sundin, yes. Representative Sundin, yes. Mr. Chair, we have 13 ayes and zero nays. 
All right, by a vote of 13 ayes and zero nays, House File 4324, as amended, is on its way to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Nonpartisan staff is authorized to make any technical changes as necessary to ref reflect the will of the committee. I will now turn the gavel back over to Chair Eklund. Thank you, Vice Chair Zhang. Uh, first, I want to thank our staff, both partisan and nonpartisan staff. Uh, we've, got, we've got tremendous staffing on this committee, and it's it's uh, always a pleasure to be able to sit down with Mr. Hulquist or Mr. Kennedy and talk on the on the side when we have a chance. It's uh, it's great that we were able to do that. Um, I want to thank all the committee members for the good work we did this year. Um, like I said yesterday in my uh, testimony, uh, sometimes we're uh, a little loud and raucous, but that's not, we're the House of Representatives. Maybe we should be that way. We're not the, we're not the folks from across the street. So anyway, uh, I, I appreciate that. I also appreciate that uh, uh, Representative McDonald, Representative Detmer, you guys are open to calls, and, and I think that we've had open communication throughout this whole committee process uh, throughout the year. And in order to run a good committee, we have to, we have to be that way, whether we agree on things or not. It's a matter of getting things done. Um, going forward, uh, this is probably the last official committee hearing that we have this year. Um, we have, <laughs> ever since uh, I first took over as the veterans chair, we've been trying to do a, a tour of the Hastings facility and I'm, I'm hoping that maybe we can see what some of the problems are there later on after we come back re from Easter recess. Uh, we will have some time and uh, uh, Mr. Stumo Langer and I will work on maybe getting a tour out there. We do have a little bit of money left in the, in the budget to be able to do that. So hopefully we can get a bus and go out and see what's going on with that Hastings facility. With that, uh, any any member member, member questions? Representative Detmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the work you do and uh, keeping everything online as, as a chair. I know that. And, you know, we still have Mr. Kerr here. <laughs> and, you know, we still want this committee. How many been up to Fort Snelling? I we have a lot of people probably that have not been up to Fort Snelling, so, or excuse me, Ripley, Ripley, believe it or not, Ripley. We, uh, we would like to see if we could get another trip. I know uh, Chair Eklund, uh, you and I have gone up there. Uh, I think we've taken a Black Hawk and a Chinook, and uh, we also have C-130s, but maybe, uh, maybe when we're done here, we can uh, make a trip up to uh, Ripley. Representative Detmer, I will. I have certainly already talked that over with, uh, with Mr. Kerr, and hopefully that happens. There's yeah. nothing better than a Black Hawk hel helicopter ride to Fort Ripley. Yeah. So. Well, Representative so. McDonald. Yeah, I'd like to second that motion. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to thank the uh, chair. Uh, you know, we, uh, of course, have our differences, but we also have some very common denominators that bring us together for the greater good of the state. And it's a good debate. It's good to disagree, and it's a good degree. Uh, I've always, I've been giving you a tough time for two years of Republican bills, and this year you did that for labor and uh, uh, veterans, and for that we are grateful, and uh, it's been a good run meeting, very respectful. You're a good chair, fair and honest, and uh, we appreciate you, all your good work, and the rest of the committee, and our good friends, it's good to see smiling live faces. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative McDonald. All right, any other member questions or comments? With that, we are adjourned.